What's going on guys and welcome back to Rooted in Reptiles. Today we're going to be talking about how this little crustacean can change the way that you keep reptiles. You're watching Rooted in Reptiles where you will find a ton of quality evidence-based reptile keeping and captive breeding information. not an insect it is actually a crustacean this is an isopod this is a porcelio scabber orange morph um, these guys are found uh, dwelling only on land um, isopods can be found in salt water fresh water and on land both uh, most species are found uh, terrestrially but there have been reports of animal are boreal species of isopod. Um, they say that they have never been seen on the ground, only in trees. So that's a very interesting kind of development uh, for the isopod community is in a strictly arboreal species of isopod. So today we're going to be talking about the land dwelling isopods. These guys uh, don't go in the water, they don't swim, they don't submerge themselves. Like you'll see the big crazy deep sea isopods that like can fit in your hands like this. They're just huge. But these guys, uh, this is about it. <laughs> they don't reach that huge size. This is a full grown adult Porcelio scabber. Um, they might get a tiny bit bigger than this, you know, but this is pretty, pretty average for a Porcelio scabber. Now there are all kinds of land dwelling isopods. Um, there are Porcelio, uh, Porcelio, Onus, um, Armadillodium, I believe. There's all kinds of different uh, genuses of these isopods. But I, I used to have a lot of them. I used to have well over 30 different uh, isopod species and morphs. And uh, so I have cut way back on my isopod keeping, not because I don't like them, but just because um, I don't know, I just don't, I don't feel like I need all of them. You know, I, I just have cut back to the Porcelio scabber and I have six different morphs of these right now, or I should say that I have more than six, but I only have uh, technically five divided out. And then I have, come on back down, back down the arm. Um, then I have, one bin which they call lottery ticket and that is where i breed just this huge hodgepodge of these morphs together to create new ones you know new colors and new designs and patterns and things like that so it is kind of fun um, to to breed these things now isopods they can range in uh, there's a huge variance in price i've seen isopods as cheap as just a couple cents a piece and then i've seen isopods for $40 a piece, you know, they can be incredibly uh, ranging in price. But I have cut back to these Porcelio Scabber because I believe that these are the perfect isopods for the reptile keeper. And I'll explain to you why. So these isopods here are extremely protein driven. You know, this thing is not hurting me. It's not biting me. It's not doing anything like that. But these isopods are very, very protein aggressive, the Porcelio scabber. And that is beneficial from a reptile keeping standpoint because they will aggressively seek out any form of, of waste protein that is in an enclosure. So that can be anything from poop to dead insects um, to uh, spilled food, like for, for the blue tongue skinks, if you're feeding dog food and the skink kicks a little out of the bowl and you might miss it or something, these guys will seek that out and they will eat it. But these are uh, a potential food source for smaller reptiles. You know, the blue tongue skinks would never pay this little tiny thing any mind because it's just not worth the effort of trying to, to track down and consume it. But certainly 
smaller species of geckos, smaller species of anoles, of all different lizards. I mean, there's just so many lizards, obviously, that these guys will potentially be a food source for those, which is okay. They're not harmful if consumed. Uh, for poison dart frogs, you actually feed them other species of isopods as a food source. So they, they have no ill effect if they're consumed. Now, what's good about these is they are great for bioactive setups. You know, these guys will actively uh, break down things like wood. They need wood for their diet. They need calcium. So any spilled powder calcium and stuff like that, they will consume. Um, any bone, like if, if there's bone in uh, reptile poop, they will consume that. They will eat the protein. They'll break down the reptile poop. So by having these in an enclosure, you can make your enclosure realistically almost maintenance free. So you might have a hard time getting enough of these guys in an enclosure for say a, a 20 foot retic to break down that amount of waste or some of these huge monitors, things like that. But given enough space, um, you know, these guys will breed very prolifically. You know, they will completely uh, breed out an entire enclosure. So that's good. You know, they, in the wild, it's insects just like this, or I, I shouldn't say insects, crustaceans just like this, along with other insects um, that, that break down waste, things like flies and stuff like that, um, that are breaking down the waste from animals, from mammals, from reptiles, from everything. So you have to to have enough of these guys in an enclosure to make it to that almost maintenance-free point. Um, you know, obviously you're gonna have to have water. Um, it would be good to have some form of plants if you could do that, because they will, the plants will take that now broken down nutrients and use that to grow. And then the plants will drop dead leaves and things like that. And then these guys will go and break those down <laughs> into nutrients. Um, so it's kind of like a, this whole cycle, you know, that you can create in your very own enclosure. So these guys and reptiles, they live together in the wild because isopods are found all over the globe. And they, they work together in the wild. You know, they, they live together in harmony. You know, the, they're not a parasite. So they're not having any ill effect on the reptile, but they live in this symbiotic relationship where the reptile is benefiting because they're having a clean environment and potentially a food source, depending on the size. And the isopod is benefiting because it is getting its food and nutrients from the reptile's waste. So I, I know that there's certainly a lot of other isopods. Some get up to two inches long, like the Hoffman Segi, I believe is how you pronounce it. I didn't want them to be so big that they're seen as cricket size, but I wanted them to be uh, large enough to, to kind of have an impact on your enclosure. You know, it's, there are some isopods like dwarf whites and dwarf purples that are maybe a tenth of the size of this, you know. So you can just imagine how small that is. And those are like the species that you would feed to your poison dart frogs. But these guys are large enough that they, they will break down waste. They'll break down wood, which is cool because you get this natural cycle going in your enclosures. But imagine having enough of these guys breeding that you don't have to clean your enclosure anymore. Um, you know, you can get away with not cleaning it, which might sound counterintuitive and kind of against the grain, but done properly, you don't have to do that. You know, you, you don't have to clean it. I, when I was breeding poison dart frogs, I never cleaned my enclosures because I had isopods along with springtails. Now springtails are a small insect that eats mold. Um, they're very, very tiny. You'll usually see the, the uh, temperate whites or tropical whites in your enclosures. Um, they are not harmful. They float on top of the water, they jump around, but they live off of mold. So they're great to have around because they will eat that mold and break it down. 
um, you know, which is what you want. You don't want a moldy enclosure. So any enclosure that has humidity, you know, is going to have mold at times. So those, uh, so those springtails keep that mold back and keep it at bay. So usually what you'll see when you set up a new enclosure is you will see a kind of like a cycle, you know, it'll go through this big mold boom and then you'll see a billion uh, springtails and then the mold will get all eaten down and then the springtails will begin to disappear, you know, and die off as there's not enough food to sustain the huge population boom. Um, but working together with reptiles, you know, you can really take a lot of the hassle out of keeping reptiles. Now, these guys do need a humid area. You know, they need a moist area to go and get their liquid from. Um, you know, they, they, and they, they do molt. So they need that moist area and that kind of humid area to help with that. Um, they also need kind of dirt, soil, and wood to eat. So I, I haven't done any testing yet trying to push these guys to a desert environment. I don't know how that would work. You know, with most desert species, you need a humid hide anyway for shedding or a humid area that they can shed. But keeping them on sand, I'm not sure how that's really going to work. Now, they, these guys, the, the Porcelio scabber, I've selected as well because they can take high humidity and they can take very, very dry conditions. Like I have really dried these guys out. I mean, like bone dry, but again, they're also on that soil. And I was misting them once every 10 days at one point. And that was really pushing the limits. It seemed like, you know, I was starting to get some die off because it was that dry, but they did come back, you know, once I started misting them regularly again, but to find out how far I could push them, that's what I did. Now, some species of isopods are not nearly as tolerant, you know, some species, they can't take humidity very well. Some species, they can't take dry very well. So these guys seem the most versatile and the price point on them is it's good for an enclosure too, because if they die, you know, it's not like you just lost a million dollars in crustaceans, tiny little crustaceans. Um, so I like these guys. I, again, I had a, a ton of different ones, but I've cut back to just the Porcelio scabber because these are the ones that I like the most. And I would rather put all my focus into these than all over the place with all the different species. So I'm happy with them. Um, I do sell starter kits, uh, seed cultures, which are isopods and springtails. They are $65 shipped to your door. And that will be over uh, 50 isopods breeding. And I don't know how many springtails, you know, I'm not gonna count the springtails. But I know, I guarantee that there will be over 50 isopods. And then all you'll do, that'll come in a container of dirt. You will literally just open that container, make sure that they've arrived alive, obviously, because if not, I want to be able to get you your refund and send you new ones. And then after that, you will literally just take the container and dump it in your enclosure and let them do their thing. I hope you guys give these guys a try. You know, these guys can really change how you take care of your reptiles. It can change your workload for caring for your reptiles. And that to me is worth it, you know. Plus I think it's just cool to see that in more natural environment. So with that guys, I'll let you go. And as always, uh, check out my Etsy. I have added some new designs. I have mine coming in the mail. So as you are watching this video, the new designs are uploaded on Etsy. And uh, check out Facebook if you haven't already. And as always, guys, please like, comment, and subscribe, and just remember, stay rooted in reptiles.